Is baseball season happening? Is that what we're talking about right now? <laughs> what kind of question is that? I mean, Gambas, this, this has got to be your favorite time of year right now. Masters oh, time. Yeah, totally, man. Spring baseball. Yeah. Are there yeah, flowers normally in last Michigan? last week. Yeah. The weather is really nuts here right now, which is why I'm having random, a uh, little bit of allergy trouble and random, like, gusher nosebleeds out of nowhere. Oh. But, um, yeah, last week is my favorite week of the year. I, uh, I, If I would have known, if I would have had a better eye on the calendar, I wouldn't have scheduled uh, a trip to see my son. But that was, like, absolutely amazing. We had the best time ever. Um, but, yeah, usually during that week, I just park it Thursday through yeah. Sunday, yeah. watch golf, yep. watch baseball yep. at night, clear the calendar. But, yeah, it's a I good like time. I like that. It- I mean, and, and no one cares except us, but have you discovered any more breakfast burrito places that you would particularly recommend? You mentioned the one place, <laughs> and I don't remember what that was called, but the, but have you expanded your palate at all in this new part of town you're in? Or um, Let me think here. No, I uh, about three weeks ago when I was in New Mexico, I found a, a spot which was... Um, <clears throat> which was um i thought that my delight might initiate the rapture sequence but it, um we're still here wow that was incredible <laughs> i felt a tremor i felt a tremor two wow. weeks ago <laughs> it was like a rapture misfire <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> uh yeah i think the rapture since it's an older early 20th century thing it's it's still operating on like a hand crank engine and it still has a couple of misfires at the start. <laughs> a couple of false but, starts. God's just churning butter. Yeah. Um, no, no. There's a place on the west side of town that I need to I need to try, but I've not okay. I've not gotten okay. there yet. Okay. Yeah, All right. I'm sort of in the low. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry it's for that. Okay. Yeah. It is okay. <laughs> it is okay. So Gombus, what's happening? What are you doing? Are you teaching? You're not teaching the spring, but you're teaching the spring. fall. I'm and the teaching summer. the summer, I'm teaching the course for Fuller Seminary on Ephesians, which will be a lot of fun. And um, uh, what other books? What other books do you like recommend outside of yours? But like, what other books do you have people read for that class? That's really tough on Ephesians. Um, I mean, there's a brand new book out by a commentary by Lynn Kohick that's out. Yeah, I'm gonna be using that and. Um, Typically for that course, I'll have people read Marva Dawn's book, Powers, Weakness, yes, and Tabernacling. Yes, and Tabernacling of God. Religion. That's so good. It's great. It really, that book Dude. shaped me in a lot of ways. I, I love it. And, it. and it's short. Which, I mean, I, that, those are the kind of books I, I dig. Power and Weakness <clears throat> is short. I mean, you wrote one kind of like that. Yeah, that's all I got. It's like, I, you know, I try to... <laughs> Do like the big boys, but um, oh, Mar- that- yeah. So it's a tough. Actually, Ephesians is really tough because yeah. it's um, there's not a lot of good uh, literature on it. You know, everybody there's loads of stuff on Romans and Galatians, but um, yeah, you yeah, you'd be surprised that there's just not as much on Ephesians. But it's yeah, it is what it is. Got to be creative. Coming yeah. up with a couple different creative assignments. Nice opportunities. I like that. We could do. We could all record a podcast together with your class on Ephesians. Yeah, that would be, be fun. A great assignment. That would actually be a lot yeah. of fun. Everyone has to bring beer, and we'll sit on Zoom, <laughs> and yeah. yeah, and we'll go for three hours, and we'll only record oh the last Lord. hour, Hell just so that there's <laughs> general silliness afoot. Um, Tim Stafford, how are you? I'm doing great. We just hit record right out of the gate, guys. So we're just catching up right now. That's just that's right. We just got to do some relational Welcome building. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if this is banter. This is just <laughs> hey, how are we doing, guys? How are yeah. we doing? We're middle aged white men, and we're here. So there's another week. Our cholesterol's probably too high. Um, uh, Gomez, have you had your colonoscopy yet? <laughs> no. Okay, you should get on that. Yeah, cholesterol. Literally. All the all the measures are looking good. Okay. And uh, he how about, said he'd how about... schedule a couple things, and I said, okay, fine. And I, I'm sure I'll get an email like in that like mm. your your online my folder thing from the yeah. health place. I'll, yeah. just, I'll ignore it. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I can tell just by the way you described Men... it. 
the online my health folder thing i don't want to know <laughs> men across america resound yeah. with your there's uh <laughs> there's a billboard on um on the way down to chicago i always see and it says something like nine out of ten men die of stubbornness and i and i, I just i look at it and say yeah yeah yep that's bad is that a it bad work for me <laughs> what shouldn't it be a hundred percent that will be i will be one of those nine i don't well, guys know. I just, I, just I, go. I was asking because I want to talk about low T. We just recently <laughs> accepted a new sponsor for the program. And, is that, uh, is and that if you fatigued, low T, yes. <laughs> Yo, low T. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. That's your hip hop That's name. funny. <laughs> low T. Yeah. The first song. Low T G. First song. That's right. It's fatigue. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. I just wanted to make sure you're all right, Gumbus, because you're hitting that age, man. You're hitting that age now. You know. Yeah, I'm feeling. I feel great. Yeah, you do. You look I great. Feel fantastic. Well, I'm. I'm doing my best. Yeah. I'm. 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 I'm not doing my best. I'm doing. I'm putting out. <laughs> I'm putting out <laughs> high average effort. <laughs> <laughs> my kids. My kids have a way of describing that. They say it's just mid. Hey. Yeah. How is that yeah. mid? It's average yeah, yeah. it's yeah. perfect like i'm that. aiming for uh, acceptable okay there's that in almost famous when philip seymour hoffman is like we'll all meet again on the long road to the middle <laughs> that's funny <laughs> so it's stuck with that's me. it yeah in um was it moonrise kingdom when uh <laughs> the camp counselor ed norton saw the kids uh campsite <laughs> and he's like i saw your campsite i would have given you a commendable <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what i'm aiming for commendable we saw your effort well yes so just for the record if you're not on youtube tim has a shirt on we can't speak for any other garment and there was a shave recently um in your past yeah and i'm assuming yeah yeah i'm assuming just this hair. morning I'm, I'm taking a Whoa. trip right after this i'm packing uh, yeah, you are. So I shave today so that I don't have to shave for the next four or five days. Nice. Um, Head to New York City. Whoa. To see Bono. Oh, no. It's that time. Beacon Theater. <laughs> oh, wow. So jacked up, man. I cannot even believe it. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. That's going to be fun. He, he's yeah. a singer, right? Yes. He's part okay. of a, a group. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. Uh, it'll and, be good. And it's baseball season. Group. Um, Tim, we've got big questions for you and um you know we we sit we ponder we ask jesus for answers and then jesus says why don't you ask your friend tim gombas and we say that's fair yeah that's I need fair. that cruel delegated cruel. delegated he authority. pauses churning butter for a second just to say <laughs> yeah go ask yeah go ask low tg yeah. the, yeah. the low tg okay i got it minute. now i got it now yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the rapture <laughs> machine's about five percent so we need another yeah. breakfast taco from new mexico now i'm just picturing the guy in is it in princess bride when he's like slowly cranking yeah. the sucking the life out of them the torture machine yeah you guys are amazing I am going to transition, however, into <laughs> our topic for today because, Doctor Gombis, we have um, we're we're so freaking grateful for you and all the work that you do and your podcast. And if you're new to our podcast, you need to go listen to Tim's podcast, which is Faith Improvised, um, uh, and uh, highly recommend it. Um, but Tim has been gracious enough for us to just explore some of these big gospel themes uh, over the course of this year. So we've talked about the kingdom of God. We've talked about the anti-kingdom, where pain and suffering sort of come from and why those exist in the world. Today, we want to talk about the idea of sin. Because the way sin was presented to me, uh, and, you know, Stafford, I, I probably for you, but, but please, please feel free to color in the lines but sin was presented as God's anger towards me breaking one of his rules. And, um, right, so the sin is the breaking of the rules. The anger was the just punishment for breaking one of the rules. And if you don't deal with his anger, then you're sent to hell because his wrath kind of rests upon you. And the cause for that wrath is the personal transgressions that I'm guilty of sin. And so I'd love to start with um, a very easy, simple question. What is sin? 
And why does it matter? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'll tell you. I mean, why I can give you matter? examples of sin. <laughs> huh. Uh, yeah. Well, I have found that I received the same inheritance as far as um, a conception of of what sin is and how it works and why it, what it provokes from God and all of that. Mm. And um, I think that that, for me, has been um, uh, just entirely unhelpful. Mm. Um, mostly because it just doesn't rep- it doesn't represent God well. It doesn't represent um, people well. It doesn't represent sin well. It doesn't represent <laughs> um, yeah salvation well. <laughs> Yeah, salvation and also like God's desires. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's I almost said expectations. Um, um, there's a sense in which that framework sort of has God having expectations and, you know, use the term rules. But it's like um, there's so much in Scripture where, where God sort of has aims for humanity and desires and, and, and even, you know, in a sense, kind of like dreams or ambitions. But yeah. Um, it seems like that also um, that way of thinking also partakes of that individualistic framework where it's like, um, I mean, I was thinking about this earlier, Mike, you probably did this when you were in seminary. It's like you took anthropology and it's like, what is the human? Yes. You know, and it's like, that's such a profound in the evangelical tradition and in the tradition that evangelicals inherited in the Western theological tradition, that, um, I mean, that's, that impulse is strong where it, everything sort of begins with the human. Yeah. So start from here yeah, and then like, um, do Work like a out. real super scan of what's inside and what, yeah. what are the parts and the will and where does sin come? And then, yeah. And then it goes out from there. Totally. And, um, I was thinking earlier that when, when we encounter sin the first in, in uh, Genesis four, it's, it's not something that humans do. It's this, this entity that's there that shouldn't be there. And so it's like, but, and it seems active, it's crouching and it has a desire. It has a will. It has intention. It has, um, uh, yeah, it has desire. It's got, it's scheming Mm. and it's, um, yeah, and it's an it's an active agent that is um, sort of entered the scene, entered the stage, and doesn't have doesn't have a history and shouldn't be there. Mm. And it wants um, it wants everything for humans that God does not want, and it wants it wants to sort of overpower humanity and, and enslave humanity. Mm. So I think that's um, I think that is a really really important place to start. In thinking about sin, it's this thing that has um, that has come into the world that's doing damage, and it has its own intentions, and it's not pri- it's not primarily um, something that humans do. Although I'd want to sort of include that in how the how you sort of tell the story, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but um, it, it wants to dominate humans. And I was thinking about how it is that even in go- like Paul uses that language in. Um, in Romans, but he also uses it in Galatians. Like if anybody's caught in sin. So Mm. it's like, there's, um, it, I mean, people sin. Um, well, I guess I would just say it this way to back up. I would want to talk about it first as this cosmic entity that is entered and shouldn't be here, but is, is ruining God's good world and is doing Mm. a lot of damage. Would Paul call it a power or a principality? Or I think it's he... uh, the way that I read Paul is I think there's a sense in which the powers and principalities are slightly different, but like the mm. power of sin is like in league in some weird twisted way that's hard to explain. Um, but sin has the same aims as the principalities and powers where there's the mm. attempt to dominate humanity, ruin creation and prevent humanity from experiencing God's shalom in the world mm. and uh, God's order of flourishing um, I think it's, I think it's really important to resist at every point talking about, uh, sort of 
I, I would like to resist ever falling back into um, or feeling the need to sort of include everything that, that you would have experienced, Mike, in like that, in the anthropology uh, section. Yeah. Like, okay, I learned all that about sin. Therefore, okay, there's also this cosmic element. Now let's revert back to talking about the individual. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like it's a really, it's important to me to sort of stick with the biblical storyline as it progresses. So like Israel was called, um, I wanted Israel was called uh, to experience God's liberated order in the land. Mm -hmm. And um, they were told what sins were and um, how to be redeemed from them and how to sort of experience God's restoration. And um, also, um, well, just to sort of step back to God for a minute, it does, rather than seeing like God has expectations or rules for humans or even for Israel in Torah. He has this way of life that is flourishing Mm -hmm. and outside of that way of life is what it is to be caught in sin and, and like, and to be caught in sin, um, is to, is, is to experience wrath. And what is interesting to me is that there are a number of mentions of wrath in the new Testament that are, that are not attributed. Um, that it's just like this, from a cosmic perspective, there's like the space of new creation and outside of that space is yeah. where the influence of sin and death are and the human experience of what it is to abide in that space is wrath. So, um, kind of wrecked you for a second. Yeah. In, in that telling wrath then is less something that God does out of anger and more something that's a state of affairs yeah, sort of like a exists. dynamic. Oh, dude, of course it's a dynamic. Of course it is. Yes. We need a, to search for a synonym. But no, are, there it's is, an operating there are principle. Right, but, but, it, but, but it's more than that. Well, I mean, yes, it's, I could see operating principle, but it's almost an ontological like place yeah. of standing. Like yeah. you are outside new creation, and yeah. you stand in... Sin, yeah. death, the powers, and that the the word that describes that whole operating system is the word wrath. Yeah, yeah. It, it, um, I I think about it as sort of like the the air that that's in that space. Right. It's like that's you're just affected by it, and it's it's got you. It's not like um, the lure to live in that way is you know that looks like freedom. It looks like right. fulfillment, and happiness. So we step out into um, destructive patterns of behavior which is sin. Those are sins. Um, and it's like sin just generates wrath. It's, it's generative of that experience. And so, yeah, Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like the, the air that we breathe in that space. It's sort of characteristic of all the that's at work there. And there's something about, um, even like the, the announcements, like in Genesis three of what the humans now are going to experience. Um, the, the way that God talks to them, the way that God announces um, the consequences to Israel for how they followed the gods of the nations and, and lived, um, conducted themselves unjustly. Um, all of this is like God's brokenhearted announcement of what they are asking for. Mm. You know, it's not like it's not like God is sort of up there neutral and like, you know, if you do good, I'll leave you be. Uh, if you step out of line, I'm going to just send like thunder. I'm going to come after you or something like that. That's so good. Um, it's, it's sort of like, this is, this is how, this is the experience of walking in that other way of mm. living those other patterns. And it's, it's just, it's generative of all the things that destroy mm-hmm. humans and, and human community and human relationships. Yeah. And that's all wrath. So wrath is at work outside uh, kingdom space. So sin Sin uh, is an interloper. Not it doesn't belong here. It has some sort of enslaving power. That would you say it's internal to itself, like sin itself enslaves, or would you put agency to sin? Um, and does Paul use that conception of agency? Yeah, right? doesn't he? Does he do it in Romans? He does in Romans uh, seven. Um, one other place, but Romans seven for sure, where he talks about um, sin, 
seizing an opportunity. Yeah. Yep. You know, right. uh, took, uh, what did it do? Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it did to the eye. So there's the eye talking and it's like sin. Yeah. He yeah. sees this opportunity and it, it did all the stuff. It wanted to enslave me. It wanted to prevent, um, yeah, it wanted to generate division. So yeah, it has like this, it's, it's this disembodied, I don't know. The cosmos is just so mysterious. The world is mysterious. And it's like, this is how these are the, um, the descriptive tools of a first century Jew and how they talk about it. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. but like, there's a sense in which it also has hooks in us. Uh, sin, I mean, sin is spoken about in scripture, like objectively we do these things. This is a sin. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just want, yeah, I'd want to say it's part of a complex of things that, hmm. um, we wrap ourselves up into and we will experience sort of the, you know, the, I don't want to say consequences, but you, you experience the, the deadening way of life. Yeah. The deadening it's like a ramification. Yeah. Like, a, yeah, well, but it's a result. Of... Yeah. But it's built in. That's the thing. It's not, Oh yeah. It's, it's, I mean, jumping off a, jumping off a tall building. Yeah. Nothing externally happens to you except that you experience the gravity that's always there. Right. Right. So, but you also experience the ground as it hits you. Yeah. But it, which but, is, but a, it's not like something external to you happened that's forcing yeah, exactly. you to fall. It's just already yeah. there. There's no judge watching saying, all right, I'm going to make you hit the ground. Right. Yeah. So the, the, res, the ramification and result of jumping off the building is that the ground smacks you. But that's not a judgment that's because extra. you jumped. That's the, yeah. yeah. Can I ask a quick question? A quick one? Because we're cooking a right now, Stafford. One. I'm I know, going. but it's based I'm in, going. in where you guys are. Okay. With what is the, like, to what end? Like, so if sin has this kind of, is this thing that pulls, and is it is it just, like, if if it has no goal or end result, or, or it can't triumph, to, like to what end is it operating on is it like the joker in the dark night where it's just like some people just want to watch the world burn yeah. like it's just about chaos is that what we're talking about yeah i that was such a brilliant portrayal of evil actually because yes. it, it doesn't one of the things that i've tried to think about that tim in in um in trying to get inside like the logic of evil and all of that when I started studying like the powers and what's their end game and all that kind of stuff. And I think that the best way of thinking about it all is madness, like mm-hmm. just madness. It's not, um, there's, it's not, uh, there's no way to psychologize it and come up with a, well, that logic doesn't work. You know, that's not the way you get to your yeah. end. And I think that those kinds of portrayals of evil, um, are really subtle and helpful because that's that's sort of how this works. It's like, yeah, some men just want to watch the world burn. Or like yeah. um, uh, Cormac McCarthy's, uh, oh, what was that? Uh, the Blood, Meridian. Blood Meridian where you've got the judge. Yeah. And all he's doing is like, the only thing that he does, he's got that journal and he's like drawing pictures of things. And, and what he's doing is taking them out of creation. Like yeah. that, it's like what? What's the point yeah. of that? And he just destroys everything that he's near, and there's not an end. There's there's not the end is destruction. The end is just gr- the end is grasping. Um, I think that the lesson that we we learn from that is that like um, that way of life of like grasping and controlling and power grabbing um, and in relationships or in like in, in community life that that is partaking of a dynamic that doesn't have a, there's, there's not a way that that gets you to like a, a, a healthful result. Mm-hmm. Power grabbing does not get you anywhere. It just destroys. And so like learn that lesson because that is to partake of madness and you're going to share the end, which is the entities that yes, it, yes. And the process, the, the process is experiencing wrath yeah. in the process. And the end is wrath. Like that's yeah. why in Ephesians 2 and Paul talks about like walking in death. It's like that's both the realm, it's the present experience, and that's the end. Yeah. So we are by nature objects of wrath. 
which always sounded like, ooh, God's pissed because we sin, as opposed to, yeah. no, we actually stand objectively yeah. in wrath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the space that, yeah, totally. <clears throat> so when we talk about forgiveness of sins, right? So the gospel that I inherited was, I'm a sinner, God is holy, God judges me, there are consequences, those consequences are hell, they're present and future. And uh, then Jesus is put forward as a sacrifice to appease the death that was due me, right? The wages of sin is death. And I uh, can now share in his life as we exchange righteousness for sin together. Um, and that whole thing was called, you know, have you had your sins forgiven? Mm -hmm. So if we, if we reckon sin in more of a consistent manner biblically, what does forgiveness of sins then refer to? Yeah. So once again, um, that... That contractual kind of model, that sort of like economic model, yeah, yeah, uh, where we, we relate to a judge as individuals, that all makes like really, really tidy sense. But it it operates completely out of out of the biblical context, where um, um, and doesn't recognize the place that forgiveness of sins has in the biblical narrative, particularly mm. with Israel. Yeah, and so like. Um, Giddy up. Yeah, forget. Uh, God tells Israel, um, you know, I had all these inten <clears throat> intentions and aims for you to be the agency whereby I would reach out to the world and draw them back into my love. Um, but your, you know, pervasive injustice and your per persistent idolatry have put between you and me your sin. And so I, I can't use you as this corporate agent. Mm. Um, and so, uh, when they're sent into exile. What's interesting is that at that same time, there are always righteous people who are having their sins forgiven. Mm. Like there, like there are people like Jeremiah is operating at that time. And you've got the biblical prophets. So there are righteous people who are getting their individual sins forgiven. And all of that is possible. But there's a time in the biblical narrative where God does not have a corporate agent that he's using to reach out to the nations and so the announcement of the forgiveness of sins in the New Testament does not have to do with individuals can now get their sins forgiven. I love this. Um, yeah. Because even, even in the Gospels, there are, there are believers who are righteous. Simeon, Anna. Simeon and Anna are right. just two examples. And they're, yep. and um, to say nothing of Joseph and Mary. Yep, yep. Um, and, and whoever else is just not mentioned. And so... Anyway, the, the temple apparatus took care of all that, which I know is hard for a lot of us to get our heads around, but that was, that was actually taken care of. But the announcement that, um, of the forgiveness of sins is that God is now reconstituting a corporate people. Mm, I love so it. It's like, it just, it just partakes of a different. Yeah. So just to say, uh, in the Western tradition, it's like this complex narrative dynamic that has so much to do with Israel and it um and like non-western kind of ways of thinking was all um hollowed out and deflated and thinned out and became this kind of contractual process whereby the individual uh yeah. could take care of his before god problem yes okay you know, without, so and like just cut out a ton of other stuff <clears throat> now stafford i know at some point you're going to dive in here and make us talk about why practically this matters. But before you do, <laughs> there's more theory to explore. So, and I think you said something that's super important for people to understand. The New Test, the, the temple apparatus took care of forgiveness of sins. Yeah. That wasn't For the issue yeah. Jesus was solving. Now, that's right. So, what is happening when Jesus will look at the woman who anoints, you know, him in the middle of the dinner party and says, "You're, you know, your sins are forgiven." Is that a hey, your individual sin is forgiven, or b you are invited into the reconstituting of a corporate people around myself? Mm. Yeah, that's a that is a great question. <laughs> I what I what I'd want to do is um uh take those um there are sometimes when 
gospel episodes um, are like sort of, uh, I don't know, multivalent. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. what is happening mm-hmm. there? Right. What's happening there? Because um, which which episode are you talking about? The four, each of the four accounts of that are just, yeah. they have their own So let's own say dimension. Luke 7. Luke 7. So like in Luke, is it, I think in Luke, she's a sinner. And so. The sinful woman in the, yeah, sinful woman yeah. in that town interrupts and the so dinner And so it's party. like, she is a person um, that everybody socially recognizes as being cut off from God's people because of her, ah. you know, what, what she's caught up in, ah, um, whatever it. it is. And it's like, um, and so oh. when Jesus is saying that, he's just like, you it's know, a he, status. He, he transfers her social location. You're yes. not outside. This yes. is like a remarkable thing you've done. Your sin, like you are now part of the reconstituted people. Like yeah. you're, you're now in space where the air is forgiveness of sins. Like you're, yeah. You're part so, of God's okay. people. So in the new creation space, we can label that space forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. And the old creation space that's passing away, we can label that wrath. Yeah. So forgiveness yeah. of sins is a place of standing, just yeah. the way wrath is a place of standing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. it's like the air. It's like the oxygen right. in the new creation space. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, it's, I like- it's a rich notion. Oh, because well, it, it's a rich notion because it does have to do with like, yes, I am, you know, fully accepted in the beloved, but also we are now joined to one another in ways that are intimate and like absolute. I'm, I'm part of this corporate people. Yeah. You know. All right. Let me get let me go one more step. Stafford. He's got the look. Look at him. Look at him. I'm just, I'm just listening. Um, all right. So this is beautiful. Gombus. This is why we pay you in (laughs) heavenly rewards um (laughs) so when we talk about what jesus did on the cross and we've asked you about this before we have one we have one entire episode in like two the two 80s that is just tim gambas blew our minds i think is the title of it about why jesus had to die like we've had 400 episodes so like oh wow you have a playlist guys now i know you do have a playlist we're a big deal now so you've talked about this before, but let's wrap it in, in the package, we're, the, the terminology we're just using. So when Jesus dies on the cross, I thought forgiveness of sins was achieved because God had to take out his wrath on somebody for him to be yeah, fully yeah, yeah. just. So forgiveness... Yeah, literally what we were told. Yeah, for forgiveness yeah. Oh, totally. meant that he took it out on Jesus and therefore didn't have to take it out on me. Right. Now, if we construe forgiveness in a much broader sense, because we've construed, you know, sin thusly, then what the work of Jesus on the cross in forgiving sins gets narrated how? In yeah, light of so, those new categories. Yes, so um I I would I would have <clears throat> sorry, I would have said earlier um that it was the death of Christ, or, or I, let me just say the second part first. I would have said earlier that it was the resurrection of Jesus and the pouring out of the Spirit that created the new covenant people of God. Yeah. Um, but what's yeah. interesting to me is uh, I don't think you could find that in the New Testament. It actually was the death of Christ. So in the death of Christ, um, this is why all the judgment is kind of loaded up on Jesus, uh, Jesus destroys the present evil age or, or you know, deals it a death blow. It's going to yeah. go down over time. Yeah. But in the death of Christ, Jesus uh, sort of signals an end to the present evil age and he initiates the new creation age. And, and it is the death of Christ that creates the people of God. Mm. So, mm. Um, so that's why baptism becomes the most important picture. Because you join him yeah, in that. Yeah, you're sort of identifying with the death of Christ. But also, what's interesting is um, uh, in Gal- Paul actually makes this connection, which is in, in a stunning way, when he talks about, in two places, he talks about in 1 Corinthians 11, the way that the church is enjoying, um, the way that they're practicing the Lord's meal. When they gather to, um, it's supposed to be a whole meal. When they're when they're gathering, um, they're shutting out the poor. The wealthy Corinthians are shutting out the poor and then give them the leftovers and they're partying, yeah. like they would normally enjoy a meal as like just secular Corinthian people. 
And um, Paul talks, Paul says, you're doing it wrongly and you're inviting judgment on yourselves. Mm-hmm. And the way that you should be practicing it is to sort of join everyone together and have the rich and poor seated next to each other. Um, because that is the body. That's the actual reality that Jesus created when he died. Oh, so good. Excuse me. This new social entity that has been created. And, and then he says, when you do it that way, you proclaim the Lord's death. Mm-hmm. So it's like, because mm-hmm. the, the eating of the meal as the newly constituted people of God is the proclamation of the death of Christ because it was the death of Christ that created that thing, mm-hmm. the church. Mm-hmm. And then also he makes that connection in Galatians 2 where mm-hmm. uh, at the very end where Peter, he, he talks about his confrontation of Peter when Peter yeah. was eating with some Jewish Christians and, and non-Jewish Christians. And when then some people from the Jerusalem church came, he was intimidated and removed himself from, yeah. from the non-Jewish Christians. And um, Paul connects that directly to the death of Christ. And he talks about how that's an offense against the gospel. And then talks about how um, if righteousness or if this rectified entity, the set right entity could have been achieved through Torah, then Christ died in vain because Mm. Christ died to create this new entity of a multi-ethnic people that's joined together across the lines of social class and gender and um, ethnicity. So yeah, Jesus died to create the new creation people of God, the church. Mm. Mm. And that's why, so that, that's what achieved forgiveness of sins in the corporate sense. Yeah. Beyond, yeah, beyond, it's what, yeah, right. it's what created the church. And in, in that new social entity, that's where we all enjoy forgiveness of sins, where we all enjoy this new relation to God. But also, I mean, that does tap into, um, what our, you know, our, our mission and purpose, you know, as far as, um, being God's right. agency in the world that is drawing the nations back uh, to God. Okay, Tim, well, I, this is my last one, okay? The look. I'm lo- talking to Stafford right now. Stafford. He's like, he's, like, he's, ready, to, he's ready to launch. Um, but I just have to get, get one more in here. So let's talk about a specific sin, all right? Let, let, and, and let's talk about how. So, so when I was uh, a young man, um, pornography, masturbation, like those were the, those were the big sins, premarital sex, you know, that, that whole sexual package was like literally and metaphorically was evangelical. Yes. Was that's the big one was the issue. Um, and ones and sin hello was construed (laughs) as my failure to uphold a standard of purity, um, or holiness. And so my discipleship was learning to sin less in that respect, right? Sin management. Yeah, yeah totally. And, and, and obviously there's a place where Paul is continually advocating for new creation behaviors to be put on and old creation behaviors to be put off. Yes. But if, so let's say I engage in, in um, pornography. We, you and I have had this conversation before. How would, how would we construe discipleship Apart from the legal contract, you know, because I used to hear all the time, well, your position in Christ never changes when you sin, but the fellowship you have with God changes. Your sin still separates and interrupts the fellowship you have with God. And so that was the reason you didn't want to sin is because you would quench the spirit or grieve the spirit or whatever. So, so, so. Yeah. Right? I get it. I I totally, I've heard all that stuff before. I, I always am asking, like, what does that look like? What do you, I don't know. It's just yeah. like, I, all these terms that there's in real, in the real world. I don't know what that looks like, but totally. But, but anyway, I, but I thought anyway. that was what the, the Bible. Yes, totally. You know, That's what I was all taught. So, so let's re narrate that scenario around these new understandings of sin, forgiveness, and salvation. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so let's say, you know, cause I mean the first John one nine thing, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive you. Yeah. Um, that was always what we were to do, right? So if right. you sin, you go to God, you confess it, and that fellowship is restored. Yeah. Um, how how should we be understanding this whole package about my individual sanctification 
yeah. in light of the new and let's try to keep it you know grounded in a very specific sin that we would say yeah, yeah i mean pornography is not god's vision for the world um no question but the ways in which it has been talked about and addressed aren't helpful in overcoming you know kind of the pornea it represents um how do we narrate a better picture yeah that's that's a good question i think we're I'm, out of time I'm, dude i'm on yeah. that. Ah! <laughs> i uh to my mind it's um that's funny i well first of all the first john one nine thing uh the way that i read that is not um i sinned i've got this thing between me and god um it's there until i confess it i confess right. it now it's gone right it seems more like john is talking about a fluid pattern of life where as a as a routine i'm part of a people that confess sins and then god and my experience um god is the god who's constantly forgiving my sins already and i'm already living in this place called forgiveness of sin so it's like this these are patterns mm -hmm. they're not like well this is between you and god until you mention it it's more like um you know communities that confess sins are our communities that are always cleansed already even if it's like thursday and you haven't gotten to sunday yet to meet and confess sin to the community but whatever um to my mind it's like i i guess i want to think positively about what does it look like for me to be a, a a flourishing person and to enjoy the richness of corporate flourishing in my community and um uh, have have healthy relationships and um, uh, and and be a person that in my community is an agent of goodness in the lives of others and and I'm also the kind of person where I am open to the goodness that others have to give to me and mm -hmm. I want to mm -hmm. I want to operate in my community in, in like gift exchange that's my dominant thought yeah we're we're just sort of mutual gift givers mm -hmm. and um. That. And, and also, I, I feel like um, I've learned a lot about God's, uh, God's intense passion for, uh, for among the people of God and in the world to experience justice and wholeness mm -hmm. and God's first inclination to hear, um, to hear the cries of the oppressed and those who are mistreated, marginalized, excluded, overlooked, forgotten. And um, in my world and in my region my church experience that's not me as a white man i'm centered and um so i want to play my my part well and i want to i want to have healthy relationships with women um i i want to have healthy relationships with women so um i when i think about certain practices and patterns of life i don't want to be the kind of person who and, and I want to be asking myself, like, what does what does healthy sexuality look like? Um, what is that? Wh what brings me flourishing? And um, how would that look in the varieties of seasons of life that I'm in? And um, I'd want to ask, um, <clears throat> is anything that I'm using or furthering, like, say, pornography, is that fostering what God hates, that is injustice against people that are vulnerable? Mm. Um, and I know that that gets into, I, I didn't know this until a couple years ago. I know that that gets into a whole other discussion about, uh, I came across some, someone sent me a podcast about, uh, some Christian folks talking about their use of pornography and defending it. I just hadn't heard that before. So I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm a fairly open person. I'm like, well, I, I want to ask all kinds of questions. I guess there are productions of pornographic, um, of porn that are, um, that are non-exploitative. I'm not, I'm not, I just don't, I'm not interested in exploring that. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like that's just fair. I don't want to, I, I fair to say. Um, but I guess my, my, I don't want to say, I don't want to prioritize one over the other, but I, as an individual, um, want to be thinking about what's, what's the healthiest I can be personally. And then, when I engage in, in community and in relationships, what's the healthiest agent I can be and an actor? Um, because I really do want to be an agent of goodness in the lives of, of the women that are in my community. 
and I, I don't believe that my sort of, um, if I were to ask me, what does pornography do to me mm -hmm. as far as like, um, well, I guess a prior question is like, what is, what is sexuality? And that's a, that's a part of an experience of intimacy and connection. Yeah. And then, um, and that's for my flourishing and my goodness. And then what would be, what does pornography do to that and to me, perhaps by giving me, um, um, short circuited experiences of near intimacy, but not intimacy. Um, yeah. and then it isolates. Yeah. And it's like, it's sort of one way. And then also, um, when I think, of, and then I'm thinking about the community, like my, my engaging of any kind of material is always making me this kind of person or that kind of person. So it's like when I, um, am, am part of my community will, will this affect how I view other women? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how it can't, um, and so I, those would be the, the ways I would think about everything, but I would not yeah. think in terms, I, I think about, I had a pastor when I was in college, he just said, it's about the video, not the snapshot, which I thought was really helpful. And, and it's like, as I imagine myself, I, I don't imagine uh, any longer like legal ledgers in heaven where it's like, oh, geez, got, got one in that category. Got to get rid of that. Got to get more over here. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think more in terms of, um, these, this, these cosmic spaces where I am um, in several, in Colossians and Ephesians and in Romans, Paul talks about putting off the old humanity, this way of behaving and, and its practices and then putting on the new humanity. And so I'm, I'm just always thinking in terms of like replacing, shedding some things and replacing other things. Confident that as I'm in that process, I am inhabiting um, this reality called forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not so concerned that, um, I, I guess personally, I'm, I'm less concerned with like, oh, I did that. Got to say it to God. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that it's sort of, it's, be, it's not between us anymore. I think more in terms of, um, I, I'm in this process of transformation I know that I have God's approval and I have his embrace. That's, that's settled. Um, what I'm going to do is if this, if this or that is an issue, um, there are one or two people that I will talk to dear friends that I just, I won't say I'm not looking for your accountability. I'm not wanting you to ask me about this. I just want to say this out loud. Um, just, you know, just create some vulnerability and just sort of, maybe generate some momentum along the line of um, taking care of some things personally. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the, well, the it pull, it forces that private into the public. Yeah. And the private is so isolating and you can see where that happens. So the communal language is really helpful with that. Cause mm -hmm. even if it's not like, let's sit down and discuss it, it's still pulling something that's hidden into the light. Yeah. And that, and there's a sense the way which, you're describing it that's helpful for me well there's a sense in which like we're going all the way back to the beginning and like the genesis 4 imagery where sin has its desire is for you and it wants to it wants to have you there um things that are private like that there's a way of breaking the dominance that it has over you by just saying it out loud to someone else like you said tim sort of dragging it out into the light mm. and part of that is breaking breaking your sort of secretive relationship with it if that's its character yes you know, yeah um, yeah well and, I, and one of the yeah. things we've talked about previously is stepping out outside of new creation dynamics i'm now exposing myself to the particles of wrath that live in the spaces of old creation dynamics yeah you, do you know what i mean by that like, yeah totally yeah um and that was a super helpful way it's not, it's not an issue of standing, right? But it's yeah. an issue of am I? What am I fueling the world with? Am I sending? Yeah. Am I sending wrath? Am I furthering wrath? Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. However, that would be expressed. Yeah. Or I mean, and even just to sort of um, pick that up and turn it one little Do click. It. It's click not it. like 
like if it was the, the space of wrath is not all just like, oh my goodness, I did this. I'm going to get blasted. Right. It's more yes. like, it's more like um, this, you know, my reminding myself, like there are certain habits and patterns of behavior where I will experience barrenness. I, I, mm -hmm. I will experience dryness. I will experience um, hurt and disappointment. Um, you know, that, that's what's out there. That's, that's what's over in that space over there and in those practices. And it's like, all right, well, what is it that I want? Intimacy and connection, um, emotional resonance with someone. Mm. Um, how, what are the healthy ways of, of arriving at that? And, and where yeah. is that available to me that doesn't do damage to myself and damage to somebody else? And, um, you know, those are, those are hard questions. I mean, those are, those are, those generate, uh, you know, intense conversations in some ways, but there, there are, there are habits and patterns that are available to us. And, um, if I'm caught in unhealthy habits and patterns, I like you were saying earlier, I just think that guilt and like the fear of punishment are not helpful, but thinking in terms of like this, these are ways of life where I'm not going to draw on life like I could. Um, yeah. and, and, and if I'm really, if I do know that life is being a participant and an agent within new creation space, and I want to enjoy the fullness of that, that does mean that in my in the privacy that modern life affords us, that certain ha I, certain habits are going to prevent that. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. The the defense or the prosecution rests, Your Honor, Tim Stafford. <laughs> no, that was Tim. So good. So much of this has been absolutely transformative, as I've learned over the last several years. To think. Oh, cool. Yeah, for me too, man. Yeah, absolutely. Stafford, go. I have a thousand questions, so gird your loin. Yes. Gird it. Wow. I want to pull it from the, if I can, some of these things from the academic down to like the there it is. every there it is. language. Let's do it. So I was thinking, I was actually, I didn't know what we were talking about today, but I was thinking about this yesterday in regards, Mike, I sent you that um, screenshot of that church that bought up all the medical debt. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then paid it off for the, for folks who couldn't oh, afford it. Dude. And so I was thinking, and, but it's, it's framed, the language is framed as, um, forgiveness, right? It's a forgiveness of your debt. Um, and I was thinking about that word forgiveness and how we associate to it and understand it because in that, with our understanding of forgiveness, um, the folks who had that medical debt did something bad and they were being forgiven for mm. the thing that they did. That's so but good. that's not the case because the reality around them is what forced them into the debt. And so the church intervened and took away and invited them into a space where they no longer had the reality that was forcing them into debt. Does that that's make sense? That's so good. So that's kind of an example of... So, because as you guys are talking about this, all these different words, wrath, forgiveness, um, sin, everything you just went through about how um, the I, the shame and guilt of sin, so using all those words in, in an old creation language way, have, they force you further into isolation, right? So not only does like something like pornography, is it an isolated incident? That, that I mean, even when we think of it, right, you're talking about a, a healthy sexual ethic, sexual ethic, sex is this, is this communal, like ultimate communal act, right? And so when you're participating the other way, you've stripped the, the communal aspect out of it. And so it's an isolated act. And then shame and guilt doesn't propel you into a space of new creation, healthy living and community. It forces you backwards. Right. It forces you into isolation. So as I think about like words like wrath and forgiveness and sin, my question then is, what is the gospel? Like when we invite people into something, is it just what does the gospel look like to you as a definition? Right. Because when we talked about why Jesus had to die and that stuff, we, we were approaching it through the language of. Um, everything you just dispelled, right? Like the, 
all yeah. that kind of wrath and language and judgment in the way that we understood it. So then how does that transform the way that you see the gospel in, you know, in the world, what we're bringing to people or whatever? Yeah. So the gospel, like on that, on a, on a, a scenario that we all inherited, the gospel is, is, um, there is this transaction that we already talked about and the gospel is the news about the transaction. Like, yeah. like you're in this bad space and, but there's something that happened and you can access it. And that's the good news. Yeah. Um, so what is the gospel? First of all, I'd want to say that the gospel in the new Testament is not really used in that way. Um, right. it's not really, it's not like the news about how you can access this reality. Um, it's, in the gospels, the gospel is the announcement of the the kingdom of God in the world. And so when I think about the gospel, I think more about like, it's like the entire uh, vocabulary bank and the, all the set, all the grammatical rules. It's the whole thing. It, it's the gospel is the speech about the reality. Like the reality is here, the kingdom of God, God's reign in the world, God's drawing in, um, of all these inhabitants of it and his unleashing of like, you know, resurrection life and new creation dynamics and flourishing and all that kind of stuff. And so like the gospel is that entire reality and the gospel is the speech about that reality. Uh, I don't think, and I don't think it's just this entrance formula, but it's like if we were to, and, and I think it takes a lifetime for all of us to get to know it and to learn its vocabulary and to learn its grammatical rules because they're all counterintuitive. And, 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 and also to learn the practices takes a lifetime to learn the, like the practices of confession of sin and the practices of forgiveness and reconciliation, all that takes so long. So I, I think it's entirely unhelpful to talk about the gospel as like the entrance formula. And because I think it gives us the impression that it's like, Oh, well, then you get on to just sort of all the other stuff. And the other stuff is kind of just sitting around right. and like going to, you know, coffee meetings. And it's like, no, the, the, these practices take a lifetime and we're always learners. We don't ever sort of get out of, out of that. But if I, if I were to talk about like, all right, well, what is the entrance formula? Like, how would you start talking about this? Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe, maybe that's the answer, right? Like, cause well, I'd say it this way, it's Tim. It's more... <clears throat> I, would, I would honestly... It, to me, it all depends on who I'm talking to. What's, his, what's the person's right. name? Where are they at? What is... Um, what, what, what's the social, social location? What's the history? What's the relational? I mean, it, it requires me to know... Like, I know, actually, how, how this whole reality is great for me and transforms me and also you know, threatening, uncomfortable and wonderful... But it's like, how would how would it translate to that person? Are they in, are they in right. a social oppressor? Are they somebody who's downtrodden? Like this, like um, to the downtrodden, um, the New Testament or the whole Bible never speaks a word of like you, your righteousness is as filthy rags. Look at you. Um, to the downtrodden, God Himself stoops low and lifts up the face of the lowly, and it's like He's actually pursuing these people and offering rest and like sweetness so it's like well first i have to learn the gospel as a language set and then learn how to speak it to people who are who are in different social locations and it's, that's not intuitive i think one sorry tim i'm going on about this but i was thinking I about this it. the other day one of the worst things i think um evangelicals did um over the last like 100 years it, it just think about this story bill Br i'll just say it um, don't forward me any hate mail. Bill Bright, <laughs> Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade, gets saved and is so excited about that. He's so excited. He starts a ministry to just tell everybody possible about this whole thing. And it's like my whole life I've heard stories like that. Oh, so-and-so, new right. convert is so excited. They just want to tell everybody about it. That new, We want that new energy again. And it's like, that right. makes so much sense. That makes so much, it's so intuitive because this is what you do. You get them. And it's like, what other industry or like, where do we find that kind of behavior going on in America? Hmm. In multi-level marketing schemes. Right. It's like, that's the same thing. And it's like, wait a minute, this thing, what, 
this thing is so different and counterintuitive. It takes a while to sense its subtlety and it's counter. It's, it's, right. it's just, it's not what you think it is. And so it takes some time to kind of get under the skin of it and get the feel of it and learn how to speak it and learn how the gospel speaks a variety of words to different people, depending on where they're at. So like all of yeah. that is in play. It seems to me, it's not a one size fits all message. Mm hmm. Well, I think that in, in light of that, like the question that I asked is antithetical to the answer because it's the like when you were talking about just because that's the topic we use as the example, like with pornography and the sex and the healthy sex, sexual ethic, we compartmentalize everything so much that we attack, you know, I'm using air quotes if you're listening, <laughs> individual sins. Um, we compartmentalize them and then we attack them individually, whereas this is a whole organic full conversation it's not just about like what am i doing in a dark room on a computer by myself it's about how i see women it's about how i edify humanity it's about how i interact in a community so it's like this fully formed fully embodied identity that then affects and and informs the decisions and the actions that i make rather than us just being told to attack individual sins repeatedly and then accountability becomes a reaction to individual sin attack. And then we all lament why accountability was never helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's because it was never a fully embodied, organic, like situation. There's a, there's a show that you guys have never watched. I guarantee. Oh, whatever. Uh, Bring it. Called, called Supernatural. Yes. And it's, you know, went for like 15 seasons, but I loved it because I love that kind of stuff. And there's two brothers that are hunters and they hunt monsters and, but there's a very like supernatural spiritual ethic to it as well. And there was this meeting that would happen once a, a, every hundred something years or something. And it was all the, it was basically like this idea of powers and principalities, like these gods that ruled over areas of earth. And they'd all get together and talk about the work that they were doing and where they're and then be like familiar names, like Lady Shiva. And like, you know, all these people would be in a room together talking about how they're ruling over humanity from behind the scenes. <laughs> But I thought it was really interesting in the conversation about powers and principalities. And then I started wondering what you guys think the God of America looks like. Oof, man. <laughs> Dang, bro. <laughs> I don't it, know. Is it a Something Jersey awesome. Shore guy? Is it, <laughs> Jersey Shore. Is it Donald Trump? <laughs> um, <laughs> Bill Brooks. <I> don't know. <clears throat> Who's the most popular person? <laughs> Would you say Mel Brooks? Or Mel Brooks? Bill Brooks. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Who's the most popular the... person in America? Would you say Mel Brooks? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he has a new movie coming out. I meant to say Mel Gibson. <laughs> I, just saw, I just saw this hilarious meme of him this morning. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. Oh, that was good. Oh. I don't know. Oh, or maybe I'm, we're yeah. elevating. <laughs> yeah. What would the God of America look like? <laughs> who's ruling over our section? Who? Who's the most... Who is the most attractive? Who's got the biggest? Who's got the highest sort of like uh, TVQ or whatever? Who's most who's most oh, attractive yeah. and most popular? That's probably looks something like that. I don't know. I don't know. I probably a white man. Santa Claus. That's what I'm guessing. <laughs> um. All right, we're gonna let you I'll go, Sam, bro. Cool. Great. Good to talk to you guys. I'm gonna Go, I'm gonna pack and I'm heading out. to New York City and get I'm out. so jacked up. This is gonna be the best. I wanna I wanna hear a full report after. Oh man, I am so excited. It's gonna be I, I I can't even believe it. I I feel you know what I I feel like this something will happen. It'll get canceled. <laughs> oh, that, that's no, just no. I, I always feel Don't that. Put way that evil on it's me, like, Ricky Bobby. Yeah, this will yeah. This this is what, this is what's gonna happen. But shake and bake, low TG. Shake and bake. That's how. <laughs> Man, hanging out with you guys is always the best. Seriously, <laughs> love you guys. Love I, you too, I just man. have so You're much fun. Thank you. Thanks have for, good for trip. taking time with us. We'd love it. It's so absolutely, great. I do too. All right, I'm out. Later.